Uh, last night, Tim called that song a throwback song from the 90s, and there's a few people who murmured, like, that's not a throwback. Yes, it is. If you like that song, you're old, okay? I like that song. We just got to admit what's real, okay? Uh, I, got, I brought a Pepsi up here with me this morning, or maybe a little caffeine boost before uh, get going. I don't really like Pepsi. I mean, if you like Pepsi, you obviously don't love Jesus. We can just all agree on that, I think, to start <laughs> the morning up, but... Um, you know, Pepsi for several years has had this advertising slogan, Live for Now. Live for Now has been their advertising uh, mantra for several years. And it's funny because in our culture, that seems like a pretty unnecessary mantra. Like we're, if there's one thing we're good at t- in today's day and age, it's living for now. I mean, we hear the phrase YOLO. We see it in how people handle relationships. I'll just do whatever I want now. I'll worry about the repercussions later. We see it in how people handle money. Like I'll spend money now on what I want. I'll figure out how to pay for it later when the bill comes. I'm not going to think about that. If there's one thing we're really good at in today's day and age, it's living for now. There's actually a bigger word for living for now that's been around a lot longer than Pepsi. It's the word existentialism. Existentialism is a philosophy that essentially means Live for now. Don't worry about later. Just worry about this moment right now. And existentialism has been around a really long time. I understand why Pepsi would come up with a different phrase because, you know, Super Bowl halftime show brought to you by existentialism doesn't have that great ring to it. So they say live for now. But it's been around a long time. We celebrate that spirit. It's very easy for us. We really like that approach to life. We worry about now, now, and we'll worry about later Later, that's what we do. And whatever might happen later pales into comparison to what seems to be happening right now. But what we see in the scriptures is that the most important thing we can talk about now is later. And if we wait until later it becomes now, it's going to be too late. Last week we had a pretty intense day here as we kicked off this series, WTH, And if you weren't here, I'd really encourage you to go listen to that podcast because that podcast is really the foundation for everything we're going to talk about this entire series. If you missed that, you missed really, in a way, the glue that's going to hold this entire series together. So catch that if you didn't. Um, It was funny, at Arundel, last week I talked about, I mean, at both locations, I talked about the Licky Brush. If you're not here, just you'll have to go watch it. (laughs) But at Arundel, somebody um, was listening to the sermon, they shouted out at the screen, (laughs) WTH, when I was talking about the licky brush. But last week we talked about how when you follow Jesus, he makes your life better. But then we said sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes they don't get well. Sometimes you stay alone. Sometimes you never get a job you want or even maybe a job, period. And when things don't get better, that reminds us that this isn't our home. Heaven is. And because heaven is our home, what I want to do today is talk about what heaven's like. Today I'm going to teach on what happens when you die. And I know this is like, in a way, a felt need in our culture, and all that you have to do to understand that and agree with that is look at the New York Times bestselling list for the past several years. I mean, if you go on Amazon to see the most popular books over the past several years, it's littered with books on heaven. And they all go the same way. They all go like this. Uh, I died, or I had some kind of near-death experience. I saw the light. You know, my heart stopped beating, whatever that is. And some mixture of, I went to heaven. I saw Jesus. Uh, I, one person said, I sat in Jesus' lap and played baseball with him. One guy even said he went to hell for 23 minutes and came back. But these books are all over the best-selling list for the past several years, which shows we have a deep interest in what happens when you die. And if somebody can tell us with authority what happens when you die, then we'll buy it, we'll listen. But our authority when it comes to what happens when you die isn't one person's subjective experience who may have some kind of mixed motives when they're writing a book that they're going to sell for money. Our authority when it comes to what happens when you die is God's Word. So what we're going to do today is look at a scripture the Apostle Paul wrote, and it's pretty thick, but he talks about what happens when you die. I want to remind you to take notes because we're going to cover a lot. We're going to put a lot of scripture on the screen. We're going to put some notes you're going to want to think about later. You may even want to go back to the podcast and listen to this later um, to to double check your notes with that. Have you ever used the phrase, spoiler alert? Use this phrase, spoiler alert, like when you're going to talk about a movie or TV show, and you're going to say, hey, I'm going to give away, like, the big twist in it, spoiler alert, here's what happened in that. Just a side note, can I talk about how we watch TV these days? Like, it's bizarre. It's bizarre because of Netflix or Hulu or whatever your choice of DVR type things are. The way we talk about TV is absolutely hilarious because you'll be in a conversation with someone, and they'll say, hey, do you watch such and such show? And you'll be like, oh, I do, I love that show, but I've only seen season one, so don't talk about anything that happens after season one. (laughs) 
And it kind of ends the conversation. And they'll say, well, do you like this other show? And you'll say, oh, no, but I've heard it's awesome. So don't talk about that because I think I'm probably going to watch that one day. And it kind of kills the conversation. Then they'll say, well, what about this show? And you say, oh, I've actually watched every season of that. And they're like, okay, finally, let's talk about it. What's your favorite season? And then you say, well, actually, I don't really know because I binge watched it in like three days. I skipped work, too, in school. And I didn't really do anything with my life except gain weight and eat popcorn. So I don't really remember which season was my favorite. So it doesn't really work. That's just how we watch TV today. But if you're talking about things that you're going to give away the plot twist, you're going to say the phrase, spoiler alert, right? Spoiler alert, Bruce Willis is dead. Spoiler alert, they kill Han Solo. Spoiler alert, she picks Edward. I had to Google that. I did not know that's what happened. Somebody said, who picks Edward? I was like, I don't know. I don't know. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you should be proud of yourself. Pat yourself on the back. In today's scripture, Paul's going to give us four spoiler alerts of what happens when you die. So we're going to go through the scripture, and I'll point these out as we go. Here's what Paul says, 2 Corinthians 5, writing to the, the Christians in the ancient city of Corinth. For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies, and we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. Translation, we need heaven. While we live in these earthly bodies, we groan and sigh. But it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on our new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. It's not that we don't love this life. It's just that something better would be pretty nice. Here's spoiler alert number one. You are a soul. I almost said, you have a soul, but that's not true. You are a soul. I mean, this may sound weird, but this is how you act. When you encounter someone who's had an arm or a leg amputated, you don't say what happened to you. It's just what happened to their body. The essence of who they are is still the same. When you uh, get an appendix or a spleen removed, you're still you. The essence of you hasn't changed. If you attend a funeral and you see someone lying in a casket, you don't say that's who they are. That's their body. It's not who they are. I've even read that the cells in your body are completely different every 7 to 10 years. So that means 10 years from now, every physical part of you is going to be completely different. We wouldn't say you're a different person. You're still you. The essence of you has not changed. Why? Because you're a soul. When it's winter, you put on gloves. You know, if you go outside... And when you take off the glove, the glove is lifeless. It doesn't move. Your hand is what give, gives the glove life. When you put it on, the glove can move and have life and represents who you are. But when you take it off, the glove isn't who you are. And in that illustration, the hand is the soul. The glove is the body. One day, Paul's saying, you will take off the glove, but who you are won't change. And the metaphor Paul uses is camping. How many of you enjoy camping? Raise your hands nice and proud. Keep them up. Like um, sleeping on the ground, going to the bathroom in the woods. Okay. I, I just want to let you know, um, there's a thing in our society called hotels. And no, it's really great. Here's how it works. Here's how it works. You give someone money and they give you a room. It has a bed. It has heating and air conditioning. There's a toilet. It, it's fantastic. I just want to let you know about that. Um, I don't like camping very much. Let me kind of drill on this a little bit. Here's the definition of vacation. Vacation is a period of time devoted to pleasure, rest, and relaxation. That's the definition of vacation. Here's, hold on. Here's the definition of camping. A period, go ahead and put it up. A period of time devoted to discomfort, restlessness, and frustration. That's the definition of camping. And yes, I made it up, but it's still true. <laughs> That's how a lot of us think of camping. I mean, I just have images from when I was a kid seared into my head of you get the tent out and somebody put it away wet so it smells moldy and you set it up, kind of sags in the middle, certain parts don't work the way they're supposed to. It's just the tent. And Paul says, in this tent, we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. Paul says our physical bodies are like a tent. Over time, they start to sag in the middle. Certain parts don't work the way they're supposed to. They start to smell moldy. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> but that's the idea here. When you look at your body, this isn't it. 
This is temporary. Our souls live forever in resurrected bodies, new bodies. This body is a tent. The very nature of a tent reminds you it's temporary. It's not forever. It's a little bit longer. Paul says that's the perspective we have of our physical bodies. It's a temporary tent. Why? Because you are a soul. Some people have this idea that in heaven we're just these ethereal spirits floating around, playing harps on the clouds. And here's what Paul says about this. For we will put on heavenly bodies, we will not be spirits without bodies. And that raises all kinds of questions for us, right? I mean, what will my heavenly body be like? Will people recognize me? Will I look the same? How old will I be? What about people with disabilities that are close to me? What will their bodies be like? Great questions. I'm going to answer all those next week. So I hope you'll join us here as we continue this series WTH. Verse 6, so we are always confident even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we're not at home with the Lord. Very obvious, to be in the body is to be away from the Lord. To be with the Lord is to be away from the body. Here's spoiler alert number two. When you die, you immediately experience reward or punishment. You immediately experience reward or punishment. I want to talk about some false beliefs that we have uh, about what happens when you die. And some of these are things that our culture has impressed upon us. Some of these are things that even parts of Christianity has impressed upon us. One false teaching is universalism. This is the idea that when you die, everybody goes to heaven. No hell, no punishment, nothing bad. Everybody goes to heaven. And I understand why people like this. I understand why people choose to believe this because it feels good. It's not controversial. It just kind of sets aside tough questions. The problem with this is Jesus. See, here's what Jesus said. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. And around here at Mosaic, we just have a policy that when you rise from the dead, we just go with what you say over what anybody else feels. So Jesus refutes this idea that everybody goes to heaven. Another false teaching is annihilationism. This is the idea that people who have not trusted Jesus, who aren't Christians, simply cease to exist. There's no hell. It's metaphorical. Uh, When you die, that's it. Or maybe if you do go to hell, it's just a very short period of time, and then it's just you're gone. Again, this feels better to believe. Again, the problem with this is Jesus. Here's what Jesus says, the Son of Man will send his angels, talking about the end of time, and they will remove from his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil, and the angels will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Immediately, if you're like me, you're like, okay, time out, Jesus. Can we go back to like the loving Jesus who died for us and wants to give us joy and his love is unconditional and there's nothing I can do to separate me from the love of Jesus ever because I really like that Jesus. And when you start talking like this, Jesus, it kind of freaks me out a little bit and raises all kinds of questions like how can you be loving and send people to hell and what does that mean for people I care about? And I just kind of have a whole rabbit trail of questions I could go down right now, Jesus. And so what we're going to do in this series is we're going to devote an entire day to talk about questions we have about hell. July 2nd and 3rd, two weeks from today, We're going to spend the day asking tough questions about hell. What does scripture say about it? How does that go with grace? What does it mean for truth? So we're going to cover that in two weeks. Another false teaching we have is purgatory. This is the idea that when people die, they suffer for a little while, and then they go to heaven. It's kind of a time out before you get to enjoy yourself forever, and it could be six days, it could be six years, based on what you have or haven't done, and then when you've been punished enough, you go to heaven. And this is solely a Catholic belief. Many people in our church grew up with this belief because we have so many Catholics in this church. It's interesting to note, though, that this wasn't an official Catholic belief until 1439. At the Council of Florence in 1439, the Catholic Church said, okay, right now, as of today, purgatory is an official belief of the Catholic Church. But the problem is it's just not in Scripture. In fact, if I can quote the New Catholic Encyclopedia, it says the doctrine of purgatory is not explicitly stated in the Bible. And again, we base everything we do and think on Scripture, so we don't believe that. In fact, it's not just that purgatory is not in Scripture. It actually contradicts Scripture. The Apostle Peter said this, Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. Your sin demanded punishment. 
Jesus took your place. If you accept that, you're cleansed, you're washed, you're free forever. You can't lose it for being bad. You don't have to do extra stuff to keep it. It's yours. Forgiveness, eternal life, right standing with God, freedom, you have it. So to say that you have to suffer after you die in order to go to heaven contradicts everything Jesus accomplished on the cross. It's like God's double dipping. Yeah, Jesus is going to pay, but you're going to pay too because I saw what you did. But God is just. So Jesus suffered for our sins once for all time. That's it. That's why when Jesus was on the cross, he said, it is finished. To tell us die, paid in full. If you have accepted Jesus, you stand before him blameless, pure, perfect, and nothing is ever going to change that. And that is why we celebrate communion. We celebrate every week because every week I want to be reminded, and you need to be reminded, I can't lose this based on what I did or didn't do this week. So we're going to pass a tray down your row in a second. It's going to have stacks of cups. We want you to take that. There's a cracker in one and juice on the other representing the body and blood of Jesus. And we want you to eat and drink that while our band is playing to remind yourself God's love will never fail me. And we know that this list is false teachings because of what Scripture says. As long as we live in these bodies, we are not at home with the Lord. So we know when you die, you immediately experience reward or punishment. Verse 10, for we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we've done in this earthly body. Now, there's a lot going on here, so I want to make sure you're with me. I want to make sure you're tracking with Scripture, so I want to clear this up. Again, let me remind you, we need heaven. If your life's perfect, I don't really got anything for you today. Like, if your life is just perfect and couldn't be better, I don't have anything. But if it's not, if you need things to get better one day, the promise to the Christian is of heaven, and that's why what we're talking about matters. Here's spoiler alert number three. Write this down. We will all face judgment. We will all face judgment. If you're paying attention now, this sounds contradictory, because let me just walk you through what we've said today. We've said, you have a soul. As soon as you die, you experience reward or punishment. But then we're saying there's this day in the future after Jesus returns and we all face judgment. How can you experience reward or punishment and then have the day of judgment where you go to heaven or hell? That doesn't quite make sense. Let me explain it. There are two words in the Bible <clears throat> that refer to places of reward and punishment that are not heaven and hell. The first is Hades. And Hades sometimes gets confused with hell, but it is actually a different place. And scripture describes it as a place of agony and suffering and regret. Again, it's not the physical hell that we read about in Revelation 20. My favorite phrase that I think describes it in scripture is where it's called the outside. Hades is where God is not. And any place where God is not is a hellish existence. And the place of reward is paradise. Jesus uses this word when he's dying on the cross. If you remember, he has a thief, two thieves being uh, uh, crucified on each side of him, and one of them has a conversation with Jesus, and he says, remember me. Jesus says, today you'll be with me in where? Paradise. But Jesus hadn't resurrected yet. He hadn't even come back to judge the world yet, so how can that person immediately go that day to paradise when the new heavens and new earth hadn't been instituted yet? The answer is, when you die, there is a place of reward called paradise. And so we understand that when everyone dies, they either go to Hades or paradise to await the day of judgment where we will forever end up in heaven or hell based on if we accepted Jesus or not. 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we've done in this earthly body. And when I first read that, my thought is, man, that is not going to go well. <laughs> About the last thing I want to do is stand before the judgment seat of Christ, right? But we need to remember Romans 8.1. It says, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, so when we say, spoiler alert three, we will all face judgment, that day, I think, is not going to focus on our condemnation. That day, I think, is going to focus on the grace of God. See, I used to have this, like, 
nightmare. I mean, not while I was asleep, but while I was awake. I had this nightmare of when I was a kid of what Judgment Day would be like. I used to imagine that Judgment Day would be like, at the end of time, all humanity would be standing before the judgment throne of Christ, and they'd say, okay, everybody, it's time for Carl Cool the Fourth. Uh, come on down, Carl. Um, we're going to show you the movie that is his life. Everybody check it out on this big screen. We're going to delete all the good stuff because I didn't have to die for that, so check out all the bad stuff you ever did. And I would be standing there kind of alone and feeling complete shame and guilt in front of all these people who are watching all the bad stuff and thoughts and actions I ever did my entire life. And then I'd get to go to heaven, but nobody would ever want to hang out with me ever again, so I'd kind of be in a corner all by myself for all eternity. (laughs) But I think it's probably more like this. Imagine that when you're 18 years old, one day you check the mail, and there's a letter to you, and you open it up, and there's a credit card with your name on it. And you're surprised because you didn't apply for a credit card. You didn't ask for a credit card. You've actually never even wanted a credit card, but it has your name on it. And you've heard maybe these are good for emergencies, so stick it in your pocket and you carry it with you. And sure enough, a couple weeks later, you're in a place and you forgot like your check card and you don't have any cash on you. So you think, well, I'll just use this credit card, swipe it and see what happens. And sure enough, it works. So about a month later, you're out with friends and you say, hey, everybody, drinks are on me tonight. And you swipe it again and it works. And then you're out shopping and you use it again. And the interesting thing about this credit card, though, is you never get a bill. And one month goes by and two months go by and six months go by and you never get a bill. So what do you do? You start using the credit card all the time. (laughs) And you rack up charge for clothes and food and entertainment and you start going on vacation with the credit card and a bill never comes. And you're really enjoying life because this is just a great deal. But then about five years later, your dad calls you one day and he says, hey, listen, um, a bill collector just left our house because they said you've been using this credit card that you, haven't used, that you haven't paid for five years. And instantly your heart just sinks into your stomach because the day you've dreaded and were afraid of has finally arrived. So your dad says, listen, come on home, let's talk about this. So you have a really long drive home. You get there, you're really nervous, you're not sure what's going to happen. You go inside in the living room and dad says, hey, listen, um, it cost me everything I have, but I paid it. Like, it cost me everything. I don't, I don't have anything else, but I paid your bill. And you feel relief. But then he says, let's sit down and go over your bill. And you glance at the coffee table, and you see what looks like a phone book, but you realize it's actually your credit card bill from the last five years detailing every expense. And he sits down, and he says, okay, let's see. In, um, in June, so several years ago, you bought a pack of spearmint gum. It looks like at the gas station. I paid for it. And he says, it looks like not too long after that, um, you bought some new shoes, Paid for it. And it looks like you went to Mexico. That that was expensive. Uh, I paid for that one too. And he just, one by one, goes over every single charge that you've racked up and says, hey, I paid for it. You're free. You don't have any bill that's due. And as time goes on, you don't feel guilt and shame. You feel gratitude and love and thankfulness toward the one who paid it all for you. I think that's how it's going to go. Let me push on this from a different angle, too, because typically when we hear the word judge, like the noun judge, we think of that in a courtroom setting. Like we think of a judge who's maybe got to throw the book at somebody or let somebody off, and what are they going to do? And that's what we think of. But there's another context where we use the word judge, and it's someone who gives out awards, like someone who presents a trophy, someone who gives a medal, someone who gives out rewards for something. And I think That's what heaven is going to be like. That's what judgment day is going to be like. Now, I really need to be clear on this because when we say rewards, we're not talking about heaven. You don't get heaven as a reward for what you did. You get heaven based on the blood of Jesus, and that's it. Ephesians 2, just to remind us, God saved you by his grace When you believed, you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done. There it is. It's not a reward. So none of us can boast about it. But here's the thing. Jesus speaks about rewards in heaven. Like heaven isn't the reward. Jesus gives you that. But once you get to heaven, Jesus speaks of rewards. If you were here several weeks ago, we went through a scripture in Matthew 6 where Jesus says, hey, uh, when you pray in secret, good job because your heavenly father is going to give you a reward. And when you fast in secret, your father's going to give you a reward. And when you give in secret, your father's going to give you a reward one day. And throughout Jesus' parables, especially in the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of John, you can see he talks over and over about rewards once you get to heaven. So when we think of God as judge, it's not just some courtroom judge. It's also as someone handing out rewards, saying, good job, I heard that prayer, I saw that giving, way to go, here's your reward. Let me push on this a little bit more because Jesus says at one point in the Gospels, What you've whispered is going to be shouted from the mountaintops. And what you've done in secret in the dark 
is going to come out in the light. And I think that's going to happen on the day of judgment. I believe that. And if you have some bad secrets, that's a scary thing. You may want to confess that now because it's going to come out. But if you have good secrets, I think that's going to be an awesome day. See, for the Christians, here's, here's what judgment day is going to be like. God's going to hand out some rewards. And he's going to say, um, listen, there was a single person uh, who stayed pure, and she was lonely, but she stayed pure. I want you to come on down right now because I'm going to give you a, a reward in front of everybody. Come on down. He's going to say, there's a foster parent who sacrificed time and money and energy and showed unbelievable patience in the times of great trial, and you did a great job, and I want everybody to know about it, so come on down. I have a reward for you. He's going to say, there's a student who stood for truth, and it was my truth, and his other student said, hey, you're just hateful, and he knew he wasn't. He was trying to act in love, but I was with you, and I got a reward for you today. He's going to say, there's a wife who is faithful through all circumstances. And her husband was a jerk sometimes, but she didn't walk out and she lived out what Peter said and just walked in humility. And her husband got baptized one day because she stayed faithful even though he didn't deserve it. And I got a special reward for her. Come on down. And as I say, there's a man who gave 20% to his church his whole life and nobody ever saw it. He never told a single person. But you know, you know how many people are baptized just because his financial sacrifice? Come here, I, I want to give you something special. And I think Judgment Day isn't going to be a day, a day of shame. It's not going to be a day of guilt. It's going to be a day of celebration. Because we hear story after story after story of people laying down their lives and their desires and their wants to do what Jesus asked of us and hear the great stories that came as a result. We're just going to celebrate like we've never celebrated before. Paul goes on, verse 7, For we live by believing and not by seeing. Some translations you may have heard before or read say we live by faith and not by sight. Yes, we're fully confident and we would rather be away from these earthly bodies for then we will be at home with the Lord. We'd rather not experience the pain anymore, he's saying. So whether we are here in this body or away from the Lord, our goal is to please him. Here's spoiler alert number four, live by faith. Live by faith. We live by believing and not by seeing. Because Jesus rose from the dead, we live by believing that we also will be raised from the dead. And this is why the brother of Jesus wrote, what is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. That's your life. You're just here for a brief moment and then you're gone. It may be 15 years, 20 years, 60 years, 80 years, but it's just a brief moment. Your life's a mist. One of my friends has... Um, this air freshener in his house, I don't know if you've seen one of these things before. Uh, this is a Glade air freshener. And the way it works is on the inside, there's a timer you set, and you have the, it like automatically sprays every so many minutes wherever you put this. So, you know, you may put this like where your husband keeps his shoes or something like that. But um, my, my wife actually has tried to use different things like this. We can't use these because I have such a sensitive smell. Like she likes our house smelling like stores at the mall, but I just can't handle that. It'll keep me up at night. If I get home, I'm like, what does that smell? She's like, I turned that thing off three hours ago. How are you still smelling that? And I said, it stinks. We can't use that. Besides, baby, I just want to smell you. You smell good. I haven't really said that, but I, I threw that in the sermon last night. She's on the front row just like shaking her head. Um, <laughs> But, but, you know, this is the, the thing of that. Thing, this is clean linen. And Paul says, that's your life. Wow. He says, if you want to know what your existence is really like, just... <coughs> 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 just look at that mist. And if that's true, if that's true, if that's you, that changes everything. You know that old hymn, Amazing Grace, has a line that says, when we've been there 10,000 years, we've only just begun. So let's expand it from 10 year, uh, 10,000 years. Let's just say 50,000 years. And in the scheme of eternity, 50,000 years is still nothing. But let's just pretend as if it was only 50 years and uh, 50,000 years. And let's say that you live to be 80 years today. Uh, if that's true, then your life on earth would be 0.16% of your existence. Like if you live 80 years, and if heaven is only 50,000 years, then your life here is 0.16% of your existence. That's not very much time. 
And you know what 0.16% looks like? <laughs> there you are. See ya. So what we do with our 0.16% is really the only thing that matters. It's not living for now. It's living for later. And so we are asking, all right, what does that mean for now? What do we need to do now to live for later? On your connection card, there's a little box that says baptism. And that is bigger than a box, and that is bigger than getting wet. The act of baptism signifies what's going on in your heart, which is you submitting to Jesus Christ, crying out to him to help you. Checking that box says, I want to talk to somebody about beginning a relationship with Jesus. God loves you. He wants to bring you to paradise when you die and to heaven after the day of judgment. He wants to reward you for all the things you will do to communicate his love to other people. The best thing you can do with your 0.16% is to give your life to him. We live in a broken world, but Jesus offers hope. See, when I read the news about refugees and drowning children and shootings in nightclubs, you know what that reminds me? That you don't know. Your time is short, and you don't know when it's over. So you have a choice. You can live for now, or you can recognize that's now. What are you going to do? Will you use your one life, short as it may be, to prepare for the next? And will you use your one life, short as it may be, to help as many people as possible be prepared for later? Let's pray. Jesus, it is really easy for us to live for now. It's what our culture does. It's our nature, it seems. It just is easy. God, I pray that the truths of this scripture will remind us to prepare for later, that the best thing we can do with now is to get ready for later because sometimes things don't get better and so we need something bigger to hold on to. God, I pray for the people who are not ready, that they'll make a choice to give their lives to Jesus. And for those of us who have, may we be confident in the hope you give us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.